I just know there's something dark in me and I hide it. I certainly don't talk about it, but it's all there always. This dark passenger. And when he's driving, I feel alive, half sick with the thrill of complete wrongness. I don't fight him. I don't want to. He's all I've got. When I was a child, I was like everyone else, a beaming baby boy whose father told him that he could do anything he wants, a president, an astronaut, but what he forgot to mention was the only one thing that I actually was. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was born on May 21st, 1960, at 4.34 p.m. at the Evangelical Deconis Hospital in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He lived with his parents, Lionel and Joyce Dahmer. I had been working very long hours in the laboratory as a chemist, while well, my wife spent her days as a teletype instructor. Like any married couple, we got into fights, but ours were brutal and frequent. Because of our constant arguing, our attention to Jeffrey was at minimal, and I often blame myself for favoring David. My parents were a couple promised for divorce. Mother gave birth to David in 1966. He was what they called the favorite. After his birth, we moved to Bath Township, Ohio. By the age of 10, Dahmer was experimenting with dead animals. He had decapitated rodents, bleached chicken bones with acid, and had even nailed a dog's carcass to a tree. At the age of 13 and 14, Jeffrey had had a clear obsession with violence, and I, as his father, left this as a secret. I think any father would do this. I mean, who wants to admit to the world that his son... His own blood is out in the yard killing the neighborhood pets. In his early teens, I noticed that Jeffrey had become increasingly insular. His attitude went from jubilant and curious to closed-minded. I went to Revere High School in Richfield, Ohio, the year of 1974. This is when I admitted my homosexuality. I was not afraid of what people thought. I liked males, just like I liked my alcohol. It was my escape, my friend, my protector from the evil. During Dahmer's senior year of high school, Lionel and Joyce's poisonous marriage came to an end. After my parents' divorce, I enrolled in Ohio State University, which only lasted for two terms. School just wasn't for me. I had better ways to spend my time. These better ways of spending time were rather gruesome, but Dahmer deemed them as fulfilling and meaningful. My first blood. After a successful blow to the head, I released my grip on the barbell. Hicks fell straight to the ground. His panicking breath slowed and he released his very last exhale. The force was deathly silent. With a shrill knife in one hand and a plastic bag in the other, I began with his feet and sliced his body, one part at a time. The warm blood ran between my fingers as I pulled apart his flesh and bone. I placed the bloody, dismembered body into a bag and carried the remains behind my father's house. I dug a hole and buried what I had done. Why didn't he listen to me? I told him not to go. He is mine now and forever he is to stay. My urge to kill was still not satisfied. After Jeffrey came back from dropping out of school, I told him, Son, I'm giving you an ultimatum. Either you find employment or you enroll in the army. I was discharged just as quickly as I had joined. They told me I drank too much and that I wasn't fit for the army. I went home. That's when my good-for-nothing father immediately ended our relationship and sent me to live with my grandmother in Wisconsin. Shortly after moving to Wisconsin, in 1987, Dahmer took his second victim, Stephen Tumai, 24. Although this killing barely satisfied my craving, it was special to me. It was who I was, my own twisted form of art. When I had to control a person, they were my canvas. As I cut, sliced, and pierced into their skin, the red blood oozed and squirted, enhancing my beautiful creation. Mutilating and dismembering their bodies like sculptures gave me the satisfaction of having a finished product. And just as some art is misunderstood and misinterpreted, so was I. Dahmer's twisted form of serialism included feeding his victims alcohol laced with drugs, strangling the victim to death, having sex with the corpses, masturbating on top of them, dismembering their bodies, and keeping their skulls and genitals as trophies. Meanwhile, Dahmer's grandmother, Catherine, was oblivious to the excitement in her basement. She had had enough of his alcoholism and drunkenness and sent him to live on his own. It was 1988 and I had my own apartment, 24 North 25th Street, apartment 213. My vindictive practices could be finally private, without interruptions. After moving here, I began to expand and explore different methods of killing. One of my favorite methods includes drilling holes into my victims' heads and plunging muriatic acid into their skulls. They gave me total control and increased the sexual thrill. I could I not get... imagine how he had become such a ruined soul. And for the first time... I... I no longer believed that my efforts and resources alone 
would be enough to save my son. There was something missing in Jeff. We call it a conscience that had either died or had never been alive in the first place. They say I have a lust for murder, love sex and violence, but I don't think that's the case. I did murder 17 men, but it was just means to an end. I ate their hearts I out. I believe it was for my own nutritional replenishment, and I needed to fortify myself with iron and vitamins. I felt some type of shared tragedy with the victims, and I desired to identify with the victim, to be one with them to share their fate. Jeffrey Dahmer's selfish lifestyle can be exemplified through his cannibalistic nature and his lustful practices of necrophilia. Early in life, I drank blood from vials. The thought that other life forms are with me and encased keep me alive. The public's preconceived notion is that Jeffrey Dahmer is nothing but an infamous serial killer, a cold-hearted man with a non-existent soul. That Dahmer has lived in his own world of solitary, committing murders of innocent victims and seeing nothing ethically wrong with his behavior. I am betrayed, lonely. I need a presence in my life. I needed a human to linger around to make me feel loved. I wanted a promise to stay. When I killed him, I encompassed a sense of power and compassion of another person that I had never felt before. When our eyes meet in the final moments of their life, I could feel that they needed me. Even if they were begging me to spare their lives, For once in my life, I was important to someone.